Welcome to the Downtown and Historic Preservation Conference, celebrating our 20th year. What an amazing thing. Let's hear it for 20 years. Now, we call it 20 years, but there's some subtleties in this 20th anniversary. Uh, Though we're celebrating 20 years since the Downtown Act passed this incredible uh, body and this incredible uh, legislature and signed by the governor, uh, we had actually a few years lead time on that, little known fact, right? The state government created this program before uh, and piloted this program before things really popped. So you need to pick a year, and this seems like the right year to pick because it's the year the money showed up. So that seems about right. Uh, I had the incredible privilege on Monday, well perhaps I should introduce myself. <laughs> I'm uh, Ted Brady, I'm the Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development that helps administer the downtown program. Uh, and on Monday I had this great honor of accompanying my third grader, nine-year-old Patrick, on a field trip to Montpelier. And uh, I feel pretty lucky to be standing uh, at the And, and welcome, but I think everybody that walks through any one of these doors and looks up kind of feels that grandeur and that this room and this building provides. It's an appropriate place to celebrate 20 years, but it's funny to watch a third grader walk in for the first time. And I gotta be honest, I just told the governor, I, I don't know exactly how you introduce a third grader to this building and have them understand what it is. And it was amazing to see them understand just by experiencing it and feeling it and seeing the grandeur and how excited they were that the roof was painted in gold. <laughs> so uh, I am really, I want to share a very quick story. As we celebrate 20 years, uh, just two or three weeks ago, Robert McBride, Gary Fox, Mary Helen Hawthorne invited a group of uh, what I'd call champions uh, to Bellows Falls. Little known fact, Bellows Falls was one of our first downtowns designated nearly 20 years ago. Uh, and it was to celebrate 20 years of investment. And uh, the Bellows Falls, Bellows Falls Downtown Development Alliance, the Great Falls Regional Chamber of Commerce, the Rockingham Arts and Museum Project, led by the incomparable Robert McBride, uh, brought 75 people or so together and we talked. And we talked about the things that have changed in Bellows Falls, the millions of dollars of investment that happened in Bellows Falls. Uh, we heard from greats like Tony Elliott, who helped found Sovereignet. Uh, we heard from Robert McBride. Uh, but what stuck with me, and I think it's a story of our downtowns, was a story that Kathleen Gavatsky of Holiday's Harvest Barn told. Uh, anybody ever, ever, ever heard of Holidays? Come on, any hands? A few? Uh, tens of thousands of people in the world have heard of Holidays because they, uh, they make a dip. Why is Ted Brady talking about dip? Well, I'm talking about dip because uh, Kathleen, uh, who currently owns a florist shop, and that day was prepping for the prom in town, uh, makes dip and sells a lot of dip. But the story of her dip is about her downtown. And years ago, she was selling this dip not out of a florist shop, but she'd go to things like the Big E, She'd go to trade shows and she'd hawk her wares. And a few years later, they bought a greenhouse uh, and a business in Bellows Falls. And guess what? The people she sold the dip to started showing up at her greenhouse. She bought a floor shop in downtown Bellows Falls. Well, when you go into the back of that room now, half of the room, half of the store, is filled with little dips. I'm talking about these. <laughs> well, sure enough, people suddenly started showing up at her downtown store because they bought the dip at the Big E, or they bought the dip online. A few years pass, what do they do? Well, Kathleen's unsatisfied running a florist, an online retail shop, and uh, 
greenhouse garden shop, she, um, she buys an inn. So these people who bought this dip at the Big E, who came to their garden shop, who came to their flower shop, guess what? They want to go experience the full dip experience and stay at the inn in Rockingham. <laughs> sure enough, they stay at the inn. Well, I think you know where the story ends. People come to her downtown florist shop to buy this dip. They stayed at her inn, and it didn't take long before those people that visited her downtown florist shop to buy that dip and stayed at her inn came in and said, you wouldn't believe this, I moved to Bellows Falls because of the dip. <laughs> Uh, perhaps an unnecessary story, but I think it embodies what our downtowns are. You know, they're centers for retail. They're places where entrepreneurs make incredible things happen. But they're the reason people visit Vermont, 13 million of them. We're currently at the Department of Tourism featuring our downtowns and downtown stories on all of our social media and interviewing people like Kathleen to tell that story. They're the reason people live in Vermont and clearly, they're one of the reasons that people move to Vermont. They define what we are. Uh, today, before I, we launch into our formal program, uh, I want to thank a few people for making the Downtown Conference possible. As I think most people know, this is the Downtown and Historic Preservation Conference. It's a partnership between the State and the Agency of Commerce and the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And every year we take turns uh, organizing and managing, which really means there's one person that technically is in charge, but everybody still does the same amount of work. <laughs> uh, so just a real shout out to the Preservation Trust of Vermont, to Paul Broom, to Lisa Ryan for the work they do. But we also have to raise money to make this happen. And we have a lot of sponsors. And I think it's appropriate that I recognize all of them before we start this. AARP Vermont, VHB, the National Park Service, the National Life Group, such a champion for our downtowns. Uh, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, the Vermont Integrated Architecture, the folks from Arnold and uh, Skangus Architects, Community National Bank, VNRC, the Arnold Block, CRM Associates, Stevenson Associates, uh, Northern New England Chapter of the American Planning Association, the great folks at Housing Vermont, hi Nancy, the folks at Accessibility Systems, Efficiency Vermont, Vermont Mutual Insurance Group, the Preservation Trust of Vermont, my period alive, and of course, the greatest state agency, the Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Yes, let's hear it for those folks. Thank you, Steve McKenzie, for starting that clapping. I noticed. <laughs> There's also one person who all of us need to thank profusely today is, and this is always awkward if he's not here, is Dan Groberg with us this morning? Dan, where are you? Dan, stand up. There is no man that has done more. <laughs> the, the city of Montpelier and Montpelier Live, there is nobody that's done more than Dan to make this happen and what's happening tomorrow, the, the CSCCX, the Creative Economy Exchange, Creative Exchange, you need to just realize what a great guy this is. Uh, finally, uh, there's one man who uh, is more accustomed to being here in this room than I am, uh, si sitting up here with me, and that's Governor Scott. Uh, the governor's been a great advocate for the downtown program. As a small business owner, as a legislator, as our governor, uh, as a native Vermonter, as a Barry boy, uh, somebody who understands the value that our sense of place uh, has. Uh, as such, this year uh, has fought for the downtown program, actually year over year to increase the size of it, but also to help our uh, downtowns thrive by making them easier places to develop in. Uh, and it gives me great pride and honor to introduce the uh, governor of the state of Vermont, Phil Scott. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here this morning to kick off uh, this year's conference with a focus on celebrating the state's two decades of revitalization through the downtown program. It's a great opportunity to reflect on the progress we've made to strengthen our downtowns and how we can build upon it. 
because we all know how much of an impact our downtowns can have on a community and really how it builds on our own personal foundations. I'm going to uh, go down memory lane uh, for just a bit. I grew up in uh, the third largest city in the state at the time, Barrie. Uh, we had a population of 10,000. When I visit some of those, uh, my, uh, my family up in the Northeast Kingdom, I was always known as the city kid. <laughs> I grew up uh, within a thousand feet of a dairy uh, farm uh, right there in, uh, in Barrie City. Uh, but I, I think about that. I was born in Barrie City Hospital, uh, went to uh, Spalding Greater right across the street, had a, had a paper route with the Times Argus, picked up my papers down underneath Lash Furniture, and then, uh, and then uh, distributed them, uh, stopped in at the Masonic Temple on the way, uh, and uh, had, a, had a grape soda and, uh, and crackers almost every day uh, with, uh, with some of them there. Um, I think fondly uh, about the Friday nights uh, going through the downtown. It was a, it was a weekly event uh, for my family, and we would just go to shop, right? And I remember J.J. Uh, Newberry's uh, Fishman's, uh, Perry Ford uh, was there in the downtown. The AMP, I uh, remember the AMP there. Uh, as well, as I was thinking about the AMP and others, I was thinking about s &H green stamps, right? <laughs> Collecting s &H green stamps. We had Harvard clothes, we had Homer Fitz, uh, and we had Bovers. Now, Bovers is still there. He's a cobbler in, uh, in Barrie. And I think Mr. Bovere, uh still goes into work uh, there on a daily basis. So we have so, much, so many fond memories, and um, it may be nostalgic, uh, but I believe it's essential to who we are and who we want to be. But today isn't just about uh, celebrating our downtowns, it's also about recognizing the people who roll up their sleeves and get things done. I appreciate your passion, your commitment, your dedication, because it shows what's possible when people come together to improve the places that matter to them. Your work makes a difference, often breathing new life into a community, creating new opportunities for people to live, work, and shop. As governor, I'm fortunate to get to visit many, many communities across Vermont. I, I see firsthand uh, the economic realities that exist across the state in all 251 towns, cities, and villages and the impact our policies have on each one of them. While too many continue to struggle, and uh, I'm reminded of this when I went to visit Reedsboro uh, in the southern part of the state. It was interesting to me to visit Reedsboro. It was my first time there. And, uh, but there was a, a sense of community pride. And they were taking us through what, uh, what, the, what the place looked like uh, back not that long ago in some respects. They said they had four car dealerships in Reedsboro. How many people have been to Reedsboro? So they had four car dealerships in Reedsboro. Uh, the train came through there. They had a hospital. They had two theaters, one live theater. Uh, and, uh, and it was just interesting to see that. And now it's just a shadow of itself from a physical standpoint. But they have a lot of pride there. They want to be something different. And they're looking to the future. And I thought it was inspiring uh, to me to see that and what we can do again when we come together to work together. The downtown program has helped transform many communities and created a renewed sense of pride in our cities, towns, and villages. We've seen it with our own eyes, our investment in towns like St. Albans and Barrie, Hardwick, and more. It's brought more jobs, business, and housing to downtowns and villages across the state. And our public investments generated additional funds from the private sector. In 2019, just over 12 million in public investment in buildings and infrastructure leveraged another 58 million in private investment for our 23 designated downtowns. The investments in more active and attractive communities not only improve our quality of life, but it helps expand the tax base and makes Vermont more affordable. Making it possible for more people to live, work, and play in these areas, that's crucial to keeping young Vermonters here and attracting new families and businesses. This is one of the many reasons downtown and village uh, center revitalization is a key part of my economic development strategy. 
As everyone knows, it wasn't that long ago when many of our downtowns suffered from neglect and disinvestment. We boarded up buildings and vacant, vacant storefronts. The downtown and village tax credit deserves some credit, so to speak, for this turnaround. Since the program began in 2002, over 350 projects in 145 communities have received almost $28 million in tax credits to help bring existing buildings up to code and get underused or vacant buildings back into productive use. Of that total, over five million in state tax credits have helped spur over 60 million in private investment to rehabilitate historic buildings in our villages. This year, with the support of the legislature, we'll make investments and policy changes to strengthen the economy, make Vermont more affordable, and protect the most vulnerable. I'm especially pleased that the legislature supported my proposal to increase the downtown tax credits to 2.6 million annually. While my proposal to modernize Act 250 by directing more growth and jobs to downtowns didn't advance, I'm hopeful next year, we're only in half time, I believe that next year we can work with the legislature to achieve these goals. I want to thank the Senate leadership, the pro tem, as well as Senators Sorokin, Cummings, and Clarkson for their work to increase support for additional revitalization efforts. And thanks to the Speaker, as well as Representatives Marcotte and Ansel, and Representative Ansel is here today, and all those on the House uh, Commerce and uh, House uh, Ways and Means Committees for their work on these other policy changes. Thank you as well to everyone from the uh, Vermont Preservation Land Trust, the Vermont Mayor's Coalition, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, and more for your advocacy in the State House because it makes a difference. Finally, I want to thank my team, Ted, here today, and many uh, uh, commissioners and former commissioners uh, here today. Katie, uh, nice to see you. Um, folks at ACCD who know that strong downtowns are one of the most important ingredients to encouraging new investment and supporting economic growth across Vermont. Keeping them strong is not easy, and my administration is committed to continuing this hard work. With your help, we'll leave Vermont better than we found it and ensure the quality of life we enjoy is maintained for future generations. Again, I hope you have a wonderful conference, and I thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Governor. I'd like to invite Mayor Watson to the podium. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Ann Watson. I am the Mayor of Montpelier, and I am so delighted to welcome you all to Montpelier for, uh, for this conference, especially for the 20th anniversary of this conference. We in Montpelier are just uh, so proud of our downtown and all the historic uh, buildings that we have here. Uh, we are seeing some, uh, some great preservation work and uh, some transformation happening in our downtown. Uh, just even in the, in the recent years, uh, a former uh, junkyard and parking lot is being transformed into uh, a transit center, which is going up right now. Uh, and you might have uh, heard of a place called the French Block, which is uh, a, an old building that hasn't seen uh, residents living there. Uh, for over 80 years. So we're so excited to see the, um, uh, the transformation of that, uh, that block into welcoming uh, new residents and the preservation of that building. Uh, I don't have to tell you that uh, having strong downtowns and historic preservation uh, doesn't happen by accident. It takes a lot of intention and good policy and a lot of investment uh, and, and the work of people like you. So I am so thankful that you are all here uh, and thank you for your dedication to the work of strong downtowns and of historic preservation. Uh, we have a lot to celebrate in this state, uh, but we also have a lot of work left to do, and uh, I'm so excited for you to be engaging in these conversations uh, here in Montpelier. 
So uh, I am delighted to also introduce uh, Dan Goldberg, who is the head of Montpelier Live, our downtown uh, organization, who's going to tell us more about what is happening uh, in Montpelier. So welcome, Dan. Thank you, Mayor Watson. Good morning. I, I think you all know my name is Dan Grubberg now. I'm the Executive Director of Montpelier Alive, the organization that celebrates Montpelier and its downtown. And we are so honored to have uh, you all here today as the downtown program commemorates its 20th year in uh, what I think is the best downtown, although I'm a little biased. Um, <laughs> I invite you to take full advantage of being in this special place today. Uh, lunch is on your own. I hope you'll enjoy one of our many great restaurants downtown. And this evening, we have a very special reception planned. We've taken over Langdon Street in the heart of our downtown, and we'll have four great musical performances, an interactive art project, food and drink, and even a cardboard pinball machine arcade. Uh, so I hope you'll join us this evening after the conference. And if you're able to stick around, we have a ton of events planned tomorrow night as well to coincide with the Creative Communities Exchange Conference. Uh, I want to thank. Uh, huge team of more than 20 people who helped me plan all of these Arts Fest activities that we have going on tonight and tomorrow. And I really want to thank Gary Holloway and the agency and the Preservation Trust for choosing to host this conference in Montpelier. I think it's uh, really relevant that we're having it here in the, in the State House, and it's, it's so special to, to be here. I grew up in the suburbs in central Connecticut. There was a certain comfort in learning to ride a bike in the leafy cul-de-sacs, but there was a lot missing. You had to get in a car and drive 10 minutes to get to the nearest strip mall to get groceries. You hardly knew your neighbor. There was a generic sameness to all the houses and the buildings. In other words, it was the opposite of why we come together today. I try to live my life by a sort of personal mission statement. Love generously to build community together. And indeed, that statement can be used to describe the, the work that all of us strive towards every day. We each have love and passion for preserving and celebrating what makes our community special. We celebrate the bookstore that has served as a community gathering place in our downtown for 45 years. We celebrate the historic building that finally sees productive use giving homes to community members after sitting empty for 80 years. We celebrate with concerts and parades and festivals that bring people together. We celebrate the art project that enlivens a block, the bike lane that makes it safer for people to get around and the sidewalk sales that support our downtown businesses. I'm pleased to share with you a film that we made that's a love letter to Montpelier. But what makes it extra special is that I know that a similar film could be made about every one of our communities. And that's thanks to the work of each and every one of you. I hope you enjoy. This is just a magical place to be surrounded by all these local artisans making butter, making cheese, growing vegetables on their farm. As a chef, I want to get the best possible ingredients I can and really just let them speak for themselves. And every day, it's just like a great adventure. Montpelier has a really hopping restaurant scene. We have over 30 places to eat. We have so many things just right here in our downtown that people want in their community. Today is Mayfest, which is where we come out of hibernation from, from the long winter. And so there's lots of activity down here at the farmer's market. And it just so happens it's also Green Up Day. It's an annual statewide tradition where across the state over 20,000 people green up, picking a stretch of roadway, park, public space to pick up litter from and basically just to beautify and make our state sparkle. And if when a place has trash, it's a magnet for more trash. But if there isn't litter, people think twice. Keeping a place clean is contagious. The Trash Tramps is a volunteer group of folks that go out once a week to pick up the litter in Montpelier. Montpelier's size being roughly a mile from end to end and 8,000 people, it's impossible to walk from your house into the downtown and not run into at least one person you know. 
I think knowing your neighbor, it being an easy place to walk and bike in, contributes to civic engagement. It's rich work, actually. It looks bad, and all you do is just pick something up and it changes everything, right? Makes it good again. Hey, you guys, we're gonna go over to the parking lot behind Bear Pond. Bear Pond Books opened in 1973. It's become an institution in Montpelier. We're involved with schools, we're involved with other nonprofits in the town. So we definitely feel like we're community partners. A lot of businesses in Montpelier are like that. One time during a horrible, horrible rainstorm in the summer, we got a flood from upstairs and water started pouring down here. And everybody in the store rushed and grabbed books and were like tearing them out of the way. You know, so people just like pitched in immediately. People care about the store. They don't just shop here, they care about what happens to it. This is a pretty small town, population-wise. It just feels like a very supportive place. Hey Claire, how's it going? Good, how are you guys doing? We're doing great. We just found Pete the Cat doing construction. I worked at this bakery as a teen, and the people that would come in really early in the morning were all carpenters. And I was totally fascinated by it. And it was a very romantic kind of fascination when I was a teenager because I had probably used a hammer three times by the time I was 20. After college, I'd studied timber framing and ended up moving to Montpelier to work at a company that is just really special in my opinion. Timber Homes Vermont. Timber framing is a very traditional building technique around here. It's a really good use of the natural materials that grow here. All of the timber that we use is from Vermont or New Hampshire. We are a worker-owned company. We build a huge range of things, from tiny little trailhead kiosks up to like frame-to-finish homes. Hubbard Park is a big, beautiful 200-acre park right in the middle of the city, and my husband is the caretaker of the parks. So we get to live in the house in Hubbard Park. Playing baseball. We're playing baseball. I wanted to be in a place where I could walk to town and there was like restaurants and cafes and sort of life in a town center. It was important to me. I think a city is defined by its parks. If you think of any great city in the world, at least for me, maybe I'm biased. <laughs> I think about their parks. <laughs> what makes the park system in Montpelier special is that the city sort of wraps around all these parks. So you go out your back door and it feels like you're living in the country. One of the things I like about living in central Vermont is that people live here because they want to live here because they want a quality of life. A natural result of that is that you have a lot of people who are really engaged with their community. So that means that people come out on kind of a cold rainy day to plant trees. You want me to get the whiffle ball bat or you want to do a super ball? Okay, football ball. I grew up here and then left for college and I went to law school in LA compared to like LA where I drove 10 miles and then it took me 45 minutes every day. Here in Montpelier, I can walk to work because it's about a mile and a half. I have essentially two more hours a day to spend with my kids and my family, which is, you know, priceless. I work for National Life Group, a life insurance company selling life insurance and annuities nationwide. It's on a hill on the other side of town surrounded by forest. There's hiking trails, and people, including me, regularly go out and use those over our lunch break. So employees work hard. We believe employees are more productive when they come to work happy. Personally, I think that's grounded in the company being here in Vermont. 
My husband and I both grew up in Montpelier. You know, our whole childhood was running around the neighborhood and walking downtown, and we wanted our kids to have the same sort of situation that we had when we were growing up. I do hand stamped copper and silver jewelry and most of it is personalized or quotes from books. It is in the shelter of each other that the people live. It's an Irish proverb. I also work at Vermont College of Fine Arts. Montpelier, I always think of it as like a bowl. There's hills and the college is right on the edge of the bowl. The Vermont College of Fine Arts, they are a wonderful addition to the businesses downtown. They bring so many great uh, writers and, and poets and, and just artisans to town. There's just art all over town. And Montpelier has a great art walk that happens periodically. We actually just started a public art commission that's going to bring more art into town. I just love the vibe here in Montpelier. I love that people are so engaged and so interested in making Montpelier the best place it can be. There's a lot of love in this town, for the town. People love being here and people love being a community. People care about stores and they care about each other. I love it that you can try something creative and new and different that will make the world better. Being able to live in town and enjoy these wild spaces, I think, is what makes this city special. This is a special place for me. I wouldn't want to raise my kids anywhere else. This is home. That's enough quoting Montpelier. <clears throat> I think that video is uh, probably a sign we all need something like that to tell our story because I've never seen a better one. So congrats to Montpelier. Now uh, I have to ask everybody to stand. Honestly, everybody please stand up. Paul, this is the only way I could get you a standing ovation. Uh, let's welcome Paul Boone to the Preservation Festival. Now. things that I think are true about the downtown revitalization um, process. One is um, the work is never done. Um, you, uh, these towns, these communities need great stewardship over the long term. Um, and then more importantly, um, this is very much a team sport. Um, it takes a lot of people doing a lot of different things um, all the time to make great uh, places work. And so I'm very appreciative of all the work that you all have done and uh, the work that many, many others um, in your communities have done over the years. It's really crucial, so thank you very much. Uh, Meg Campbell um, has been working for us for a long time. Um, her primary responsibility is um, managing our easement program, but she does many other things. And in the last several years, 
uh, one of the things that she has focused on is storytelling. And uh, not only has she done that work for the Preservation Trust, she's done it for nonprofits um, statewide to try to help all nonprofits tell their stories uh, better. And um, Chris Cochran and Gary um, wanted to do something special to commemorate the uh, the 20th, to tell the story uh, of, try to tell a bit of the story at least of uh, these past 20 years. And um, they pressed Meg into service and that's what you're about to see. And I think you'll be very proud of what you all have accomplished. Thanks very much. For generations, Vermont's downtowns have been the gathering spaces for residents and a major economic driver that attracts visitors, businesses, and commerce. They embody hundreds of years of public investments in roads, sewers, water, and buildings. They create the critical mass of activities needed to facilitate business, learning, and culture. They represent our shared history tell an important story, and make Vermont, Vermont. However, it was not too long ago that many of Vermont's downtowns suffered from deteriorating buildings, vacant upper floors, and shuttered storefronts. A series of natural disasters pushed many downtowns closer to the brink of failure. In March 1992, ice jams on the Winooski River created one of the worst floods in Montpelier's history. In Randolph, a series of calamitous fires destroyed buildings that housed 10 of the 21 businesses, leaving a gaping hole in the downtown. The rapid growth of shopping malls and commercial strip development made matters worse. The growing threat of big box development led the National Trust for Historic Preservation in an unprecedented move to add the entire state of Vermont to its list of 11 most endangered places in 1993. Vermont's downtowns were in crisis. In 1998, leaders from around the state gathered to see what could be done on more than a scattered local level. The upshot was House Bill 278 and the creation of sorely needed funding and tools to support all those who are working hard to restore the vibrancy of their downtowns. While the change was slow at the beginning, it quickly gathered momentum. The legislation that created the downtown program was implemented in 1999 and that year, Nine downtowns received downtown designation. Soon others followed. The Village Center program was created in 2002 to help smaller communities. Today, Vermont has 23 designated downtowns and over 160 designated village centers. Downtown designation provides communities with financial incentives, training and technical assistance to support local efforts to restore historic buildings, improve housing, design walkable communities, and encourage economic development by incentivizing public and private investments. A major tool of downtown rehabilitation is the tax credit program. Established in 2000, these tax credits support new housing, attract new businesses, foster business expansions, and create good jobs in downtowns and villages across the state. Thanks to the support of several governors, the legislature, and advocates, the amount of state funding available for this program has grown from $300,000 per year in 1999 to $2.6 million per year in 2019. Yet the story of the downtown program 
is more than designations and tax incentives. It is a story of transformation. 20 years ago, downtown St. Albans was struggling. There were few thriving businesses. Only one or two restaurants remained open and important buildings like the St. Albans House were run down and dilapidated. Following downtown designation, a community visioning process paved the way for the 2009 master plan. With this blueprint in hand, new funding sources opened up and revitalization began. Today, thousands of new visitors plus area residents bring renewed vitality to St. Albans. Infrastructure includes a new state office building, parking garage, and 88-room hotel. Storefronts are occupied and food, fun, and families fill the streets. St. Albans shows how concerted planning can create tangible, transformative results. When the Winooski Mills shuttered in the 1950s, the city struggled for decades to reinvent itself. In the 1970s, urban renewal efforts demolished several downtown city blocks. In the 1980s, Economic development efforts centered on conversion of the Champlain Mill into a shopping destination and offices. By the early 2000s, the building was largely vacant. After receiving state downtown designation in 2003, Winooski worked with local officials and the community to write an ambitious action plan to create a place where people could walk to work and enjoy vibrant street life. The Winooski Downtown Redevelopment Project aimed to infill and revitalize the fragmented downtown area with new multi-story mixed-use buildings and a 1,200 vehicle parking structure. The work to make it happen kicked off with financing offered by the state and the creation of a tax increment financing district to support building construction and major infrastructure improvements, including new water, sewer, parking, sidewalks, and streets. A new downtown in Winooski emerged, and its work won the city national recognition and a Smart Growth Award in 2006. Today, Winooski bustles with excitement and activity, with hundreds of new housing units and downtown jobs, a popular farmer's market, and thriving nightlife, demonstrating that thoughtful participatory planning, plus local and state financing, can truly turn a community around. Successful revitalization is not just limited to downtowns. In the early 2000s, several buildings along Hardwick's Main Street were run down, underused, or even condemned. In 2005, a tragic fire gutted a prominent building in the heart of the village. Rather than tearing it down to create a parking lot, the owner chose reconstruction and created space for new businesses and housing within the historic building. Since 2005, multiple buildings in Hardwick have been rehabilitated with the help of tax credits, jumpstarting new businesses and creating jobs, developing quality housing, and bringing new vitality to the commercial district. Hardwick demonstrates that saving one historic building and the combination of determined property owners and downtown tax credits can spur redevelopment of an entire community. In 2011, Wilmington was struggling economically with declining population and slowing tax revenue. The damage from Tropical Storm Irene was among the worst in the state. 80% of the structures were damaged and every business was forced to close. In response, a number of energetic organizations were formed to lead the downtown's revival. Working alongside municipal staff, organization leaders worked to foster economic development via a new partnership between the public and private sector. The downtown designation and the tax credit program, along with special flood provisions enacted by the legislature, played a critical role bridging the financial gap and attracting investors needed to restore the downtown to its former glory. 
Wilmington shows what can happen when people unite around a shared goal to rebuild a devastated downtown economy. Thanks to the hard work of municipal leaders, residents, a dedicated group of second homeowners, local foundations, businesses, private investors, and state policymakers, Wilmington's future is on solid ground. In other parts of the state, Successful state-supported transformation is happening every day, one project at a time. Celebrating the 20th anniversary of the downtown program means celebrating not only the transformations of downtowns, but also the deeply committed people who roll up their sleeves and get things done. In addition to the statewide leaders and downtown managers who have grown the programs, there are thousands of Vermonters who serve on a town board, volunteer for the community potluck, grab a shovel to install a park bench, or pull off spectacular public events of all kinds. To all of these leaders and citizens, we are incredibly grateful. Vermont as we know it today would not exist were it not for the hard work of all over the past 20 years. As the downtown program looks to its future, we are thankful for all of you who show what is possible when people come together to improve the places that matter to them. With your help, we will continue to do the hard work to ensure our downtowns are well positioned to thrive for generations to come. Meg, you have a career in voiceover. That was fantastic. Uh, thank you to the Preservation Trust and to Meg. That was really uh, what a great history. And I love that picture of me with hair. <sighs> so before we celebrate the people of the past in a moment, I want to just celebrate the people of today. Uh, the conference takes a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of planning, uh, and it takes a team. And we talked about the Preservation Trust and the ACCD team, but there's a group of people specifically at ACCD that I just asked to stand quickly. Chris Cochran and stay standing, Chris, our director of uh, the Community Planning and Revitalization Office. Richard Amore, Richard, where are you? We're up top, nice Richard. Stay standing, Jacob Hemrick. Jacob, thank you. Gary, the Gary Holloway, Gary. Yeah, his own stand. <laughs> Uh, Faith Ingleswood, Faith, where are you? I know you're in the room back there. Thank you, Faith. Jenny Lavoie, Jenny. Come on, right up with Richard, yeah? No? Okay, and then uh, V. Caitlin Corkins. Caitlin, where are you? Yeah. Let's hear it for the planning committee. So uh, at Moments in History, uh, there's something magical that happens. A spark, a group of people unite, come uh, to earth, come to a state, come to a town, and there's really no explanation how it happens. Uh, whether it's the founding of a country, the founding of a state, uh, the founding of the organizations like VHCB, Housing Vermont, you look back what happened 30 years ago in this state, and the creative energy and the great people that happen to be in this state collaborating. Uh, and then there's the downtown program. This thing did not happen but for leadership and collaboration amongst a group of people. Uh, today, I want to specifically recognize those people. And as I recognize you, I'd ask that you come to 
the front of the house chamber and stand to my right. Uh, don't fight over who gets to be closest to me. <laughs> uh, and uh, Governor Scott, if I could ask you to join me at the rostrum, that'd be great. So there was, back in the mid to late 90s, one of these groups of sparks, the happenstance that they all came together and talked to one another and communicated and made something magical happen. Uh, one of the first I want to invite up here is uh, Greg Brown, the commissioner of uh, the agency at the time. Come on down, Greg. We all know Greg so well as a fierce advocate for Southern Vermont today, but in his time as a regional planning commission director, in his time as commissioner, chair of so many boards, uh, he was a leader that made this happen uh, when he was in charge of this agency. Uh, a person I have only heard of until last night as I believe our state's first state historic preservation officer, the first law of the land that says history matters, history is economic development, history defines the state of Vermont, the legendary Townie Anderson. Townie, come on down. You can clap for each of them, it's okay. There are people we all meet when we start in this line of community economic development who you think are in charge of this program because they have knowledge, substance, and passion. And for the longest time, two of those people, I want to introduce each individually, they're the people that introduced me to this program. Uh, at the time, uh, the co-director of the downtown program, the Jane Lendway. Jane, come on down. Um, perhaps a man who looks like he's enjoying retirement, retirement more than anybody I've ever met, uh, who uh, stands shoulders above the rest of us downtown advocates, I think you're even as tall as me, uh, Josh Bessie, the co-director of the program. Josh served as the Director of Community and Planning and Revitalization, the job that Chris Cochran has for more than a decade. And um, Chris, you haven't done as good a job as him. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so you have these incredible people who are doing wonderful things. Uh, the Executive Director of the Forum on Sprawl at the time, Beth Humstone. Beth, come on down. The president of the Preservation Trust of Vermont, the legendary Paul Brune. Paul, get your butt up here. Maybe you should go to my left. Seriously, I think we're going to get too far down there. Is that okay? Oh, thanks, Paul. Uh, so. Our founders of the program needed somebody to actually found a program and write it into law. And we have two of the co-sponsors of this legislation with us today. And I assume that at the time, they knew exactly what they were doing and how big this would be, right? Um, but we're really lucky to be joined by uh, the former Hardwick and Walden representative, Paul Sillo. Paul, come on up. And another uh, co-sponsor of the Downtown Development Act from uh, Brattleboro, former Representative uh, Ginny Milkey. Representative Milkey. <laughs> There's more, believe it or not, because we all know it takes leadership and collaboration, which means a lot of people. So these people come up with this fantastic idea. These people advocate. These people are responsible for designing and going to the legislature and selling this. You need somebody to whisper in the ears of people and say, it's a good idea. Trust me. 
and they're people that hold positions of authority outside of legislative and government, le the legislature and government and the administration. And I think we all know one of them who's better at twisting arms without letting anybody see it uh, than Gus Selig, who's the executive director of <laughs> Live My Housing and Conservation Board. The long arc of moral justice, did I get there or help me? Close. The arc of moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I think you could hear that. We've all heard Gus say that before. It bent towards justice over 20 years. Another great uh, leadership organization uh, was uh, Housing Vermont, uh, who's been advocating for such a long time, and our current executive director, Nancy Owens. Nancy, come on up. And finally, we all do board work, right? Raise your hand if you sit on one board. Okay. There's one man here who has sat on the downtown board for 20 years, giving us historical knowledge, expertise, and a passion and commitment for this program. Uh, lastly, Michael McDonough, board member since 1999. Come on down. So I'm going to make you uh, uh, wait one moment here while we present to each of these incredible founding members a commemorative pen that, uh, I don't need to open it, you know what a pen looks like. <laughs> it's very special. <laughs> so Governor, would you mind, uh, I'll join you and you can pass right. them out. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. That's what a 20-year board member knows. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's classier. <laughs> Let's just go to this side. Doesn't he look happy? <laughs> all right, let's hear it to your feet for the reason you're all here. <laughs> It gives me a uh, great pleasure to say uh, you're welcome to stay or go to your seats, founders. That's your choice. Paul's going to lead him. It gives me great pleasure now to uh, introduce our uh, acting commissioner for the Department of Housing and Community Development, Mr. Josh Hanford. Josh, good luck getting up here against the current. <laughs> wow. 
Wow, what an amazing crowd. Uh, so much to celebrate today, uh, but yet so much work to still be done. Um, I'm here to introduce the keynote speaker, Ethan Kent. Uh, and before I do that, I just want to give another round of thank yous to everyone involved in pulling this conference off. Um, I know specific groups and organizations have been called out, uh, but it takes a lot of work. I've seen uh, a buzz uh, activity around the office just buzzing for, for weeks to pull this off. The volunteers, the city of Montpelier, the staff here at the State House, it's just been amazing, and uh, I think we all look forward to the rest of the day. So our keynote speaker, Ethan Kent, met him last night. We had a, a good chat. Uh, he's the Senior Vice President of uh, Projects for Public Spaces. Ethan works to support placemaking, organizations, projects, and leadership around the world, building a global placemaking movement, making systematic change uh, towards place-led urbanization. Over the last 20 years, Ethan's been to over 900 cities, 60 countries. You know, you must have some good frequent flyer miles. Um, advancing the cause of placemaking in public spaces. Um, I think we've, we've seen some of that in our slides here, but we're really interested in hearing Ethan's thoughts. Uh, he's been a leader in the development of this movement, uh, which is a transformative uh, approach to economic development, environmentalism, transportation planning, governance, resiliency, equity, and design. Uh, so thanks for coming and sharing uh, your experiences with us. Thank you. So, wow, um, it is it's such an honor to get to, to be here with you, all of you. Um, I've, always, I've always thought of Vermont as the place that has the deepest connection to place. And I've also always thought of Vermonters as the people that are most allow themselves to be shaped by their place. Of course, that's because you also best shape places. So place making is the process through which we shape our shared places. The process through which we give purpose and meaning to space. Um, now, y you all have been doing this for generations, um, and you've been leading placemaking for generations. Um, around, the, around the world, around the country, uh, we all have, a, have an idea of the special sense of place of Vermont. Um, the, the, way, the way you've led, pres and, it, and it really does come down to specific policy ideas, the way you've collaborated. Um, it comes down to uh, these ideas that have gone viral around the world, the way you've led on preservation, on tax credits, on preventing big box stores, um, and pre preserving uh, the historic character, leading on farmers markets, and. It all you know, connections between local agriculture. It's very specific ideas, but cumulatively, this has led an example of, of what place means in the world and how, um, how increasingly we're seeing people want to connect deeper to place. They want to connect to, um, and they want to connect to each other through place. We see the, the core of many crises around the world, from equity to health, to environmentalism is a crisis of disconnection, of disconnection to each other and disconnection to place. And we see a focus on place as Vermont has led the way on as the means to heal and reinvent this, this, these relationships. Now, what, so what you do here matters a lot. What you all have done, built together, um, and it goes viral. Uh, everywhere you go, people you hold up Vermont as an example. Um, we all want to have a connection to Vermont. We all talk about our trips here. Whether we even have ever been here or whether people have ever come here, they, they know that sense of place. Um, on a personal level, uh, I've, I've gotten to come here about once a year my whole life for, for various reasons, for, for pleasure, for work. Um, and I, I, I proudly feel connected to Vermont through my ancestry. Um, I'm not sure if I can prove it, but I, I, was, I was actually named after Ethan Allen because my family thought I was related to him. I think I, think I am. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was born a centennial year, and um, I'm also, I definitely am descended from, um, from, uh, from the Morgan, not the horse, but um, the, uh, 
<laughs> but uh, Justin Morgan. But uh, uh, I've always felt deeper connections that way. But there's many ways we all want to feel connected to Vermont and its history. And you and the, the culture of Vermont is a welcoming culture and allows us to feel connected to it, even if we don't live here or come here. But I also want to talk about how to challenge you guys to continue to lead on this and how placemaking can continue to invite people to c come here to be a tourist, to add to Vermont, to move here on your terms in ways that add to this continued legacy and, sh and shared value and shared places. So you know, Vermont is, is much more than, than, than the rural landscape. Uh, there's, there's a lot of purpose and meaning in the rural landscape as well that has been created by your agricultural systems and how you've done that well. But of course, it's, it's your downtowns. It's the way you've preserved them historically in a unique way that leads the country um, that is where you've added the, the most layers of purpose and meaning for many different people. And how you've done that recently in space, you know, how you've, how you've done markets and fairs and art walks and all these programs that you're leading on, again, adds so, allows so many different people to have layered experiences, layered connections to the place and to each other um, that is so powerful. Um, but my train ride up here, uh, I didn't, uh, from the train, I didn't get to see that many downtowns. I was craving that, that downtown experience. And this was the first downtown I saw. I think it's Randolph, New York. And of course, the first image that I see from the train uh, is an advertisement for how it's more like New York um, <laughs> and where I just come from. Uh, so uh, you know, we, we need to keep challenging to lead with place, the authentic you know, def de uh, definition of place defined locally. Um, one of our first placemaking, early placemaking efforts with the federal government was actually here in Montpelier um, about 25 years ago, I think. We did a demonstration project in front of your post office and did this place evaluation game that we'll train you all in uh, to have people listen to each other, talk about how this place can better serve their needs. Um, and I think, this, as I understand it, they removed the reflective glass from the windows, uh, put some seating out front, and. Uh, waste basket and, and made this a place that you can stop and, and gather and people slow down and have conversations in. So obviously you've gone, uh, Montpelier is now leading the way on so many, on so many levels um, and Wade has is, is, you know, recently done these amazing projects that are you know, the best, are leading models of temporary placemaking of parklets, of, uh, of, of, these, of um, these small pocket parks and so forth. So creative and so reflective of the community through which they came. Um, and these, these small parklets, I love this one in particular. It's so wonderful to take it to parking lots, are, are drains on the, on the shared value, um, the sense of place of a, of a, of a community. Uh, but just taking out one parking spot and making that into a place really changes that, that dynamic. But, but this is also placemaking. People sitting on porches in lower income parts of, of, of uh, the state, of the city. Um, we, we had a wonderful conversation with, with this mother, daughter, and granddaughter who, who've been sitting on this porch for 20 years. They say some people think they're, they, they said that some people think they're strange for sitting there, but they're the social hub, they're the social glue, the social capital of this community. They, they watch everything, they know what happens. They're a, the hub of a network of many families that support each other and watch each other's children. Uh, this is a down Barry Street. Um, so placemaking is allowing informality. It's allowing people to take ownership over, to move from the backs of their home to the front of their home, to, to be stewards of their world. We think you know, the environmental crisis is how we've actually receded our responsibility into our homes, into our cars. And, the, and placemaking is a means to reinvent our relationship to the environment, to, to take responsibility for the world beyond our home, to sit on our porches again. Um, and so we, we, these, how, how we sit, where we choose to sit, where we choose to spend time, to be slow, uh, to connect with each other, is the heart of our connection to place. And these, these benches uh, in Zurich, uh, this artist designed benches, spawn many public art programs around the world, including the Cows on Parade program and, and others. Um, but we took pictures of these benches because we thought they were cool benches. But afterwards, we realized that they reveal something much more. They reveal that the people choose to sit on the bench that, re that matches their personality, their culture, their identity. Uh, so this guy looks like a pharmacist. They, they start to take on the culture and life of that bench. Um, you know, these, these sort of fancy guys wouldn't have sat on any other bench. Those, that couple wore the silver pants that matched that bench. Um, these, this family was, became part, they didn't realize the likenesses of them was actually painted on the bench <laughs> behind them. 
uh, you know, and so each, each, each group became part of the bench that they sat in. So that goes for, you know, you know, we're very discerning about where we choose to be, where we choose to sit, uh, but even more so we're discerning about where we choose to live, where we choose, the city we live in, this, the community we live in. And we take on the personality of that, that place. So the place creates us, uh, we create the place. Um, you all have created this, this, your communities, Vermont. Um, the state house came from the culture of collaboration, of placemaking that Vermont's so powerful about. And, and this room has continually created that placemaking, collaboration, great legislation that's gone viral around the world, around the country. Um, but you also, we have to remember that if we don't create places, we, we attract behavior that isn't as, as constructive. We, it doesn't create stronger people, strong, uh, stronger connections to place. So in an era now where people can move where they like, where people can invest where they like more than ever, their, their place matters more than ever. And that's a major competitive factor for Vermont. The, uh, the, so, but it's the, it's the ways that, it's not just making communities livable that makes them competitive, because a lot of cities are livable. A lot of, a lot of cities have the same amenities, uh, quality of life. A lot of cities are affordable now. A lot of them are not. Um, but you can take advantage of your affordability to allow people to come and shape your community. People that have lived here forever, or people that are coming from afar, but challenge them and support them to help shape your place, to make the places more special, more, ident more welcoming, um, more unique, and those are the communities that are going to thrive most in the future. So we think we need to move where there's a development paradigm around the world we're trying to shift people to from what we call project-led to place-led. Project-led is, is good. Let's build facilities, build the, um, the roads, the parks, the, the buildings. Discipline-led is let's get the best experts to build better facilities, more aesthetic, more creative facilities. Place-sensitive is let's you know, as, as legislators, as experts, as downtown managers, let's be responsive to communities, to, let's be collaborative uh, in our solutions. The way we have to start moving to is what we call place-led, where place, the shared value of place, place capital, we call it, drives all of our, our, our goals. And building the capacity of a community to shape place is the goal. So not just delivering places to, to communities, delivering the projects better, but building capacity of, of communities to work together. In a way, the, you know, the great communities of Vermont emerged because of this more local civic infrastructure, this local community-driven uh, informal placemaking. Um, we need to learn how to do that again in many parts of the world. You're still doing it very well. You still have that volunteerism, that, that civic ethic where every business is competing to contribute to the shared value of the place, where the way people behave as they walk down the street, they want to add to the experience of everybody else, they make eye contact, they smile. Uh, the, the way we pr do preservation um, is giving love to the street. These buildings preserve the love that people have given to the street in the, in the past and continue to build on that. Um, so the placemaking movement is global. And I'll talk more about that later, but it, you, know, you might say it's, it, these dots are centered around Vermont. Um, so we have this uh, placemaking leadership council, the people leading the placemaking movement from all parts of the world. Um, we've been working with UN Habitat uh, in a series of conferences to make place and public space central to the new urban agenda, to, to the way we shape cities. Um, when the UN Habitat was started, uh, the UN was more focused on just housing units, but they figured out that just building housing units doesn't build communities. Um, just building good planning, good urban development doesn't build communities. We really need to turn upside down the way we shape our communities to start with public spaces and to start with public spaces that are places. So Cecilia Martinez, who's on our board and um, was with the UN Habitat, says that we're creating a global movement to shape spaces into places, to give purpose and meaning to space. Um, but I think that's done best in a rural area. It's done best in a small town. It's where, that's where it's modeled, and that's where the b models for place-led governance, financing, development can best be developed and scaled. That's where we can reconnect to place and reinvent these models globally. People know how to behave in a, in a, in a rural community, um, 
as part of a place-making conversation. Um, so we've actually been lucky to get to work in a lot of rural communities at Project for Public Spaces. We've, uh, we've, 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 because of people in Vermont, because of R Rebecca Sanborn Stone, who I hope is here, um, we worked with the Orton Foundation, and she wrote this proposal for Project for Public Spaces and Orton to run the Citizens Institute on Rural Design, which is a, a resource for rural communities to do community-based planning. It's one of the only federal programs to support that. Um, we held, in the previous administration, we held a rural placemaking summit with many people from Vermont and all over the country, um, celebrating the leadership that we're seeing, uh, but, but bringing it further. Um, and we work with National Main Street. We actually helped set up the National Main Street program uh, and have continued to work with them to use placemaking to expand their impact, their partners, uh, and, and so forth. So, so there's how, but the new models for Main Street governance for management are, are really the heart of, uh, of this conversation and where we're, we're working um, to have to, to build and draw on this impact. Um, so the, the Citizens Institute on Rural Design is a partnership of the National Endowment for the Arts and USDA, um, as well as Orton and Project for Public Spaces. Uh, and that's where the program has worked. We actually just handed this program over to another partner, but we, it's, it's, this momentum is still building. So, but wherever we go place, in placemaking, people come to it from different causes. People come to it from a preservation cause or as an environmentalist, or as a food systems advocate, uh, or as a health advocate, or as a transportation advocate. And we're finding how a focus on place can facilitate more fundamentally addressing their goals, drawing demand for their solutions, and most importantly, creating collaboration amongst other advocates, other, other solutions. We're simply not accomplishing the goals we need to accomplish to save the world for people. We need new systems, new, new means of participation, and we think a focus on place is gonna enable that innovation, that collaboration, that I think is actually happening informally at, uh, on many scales here. But we need to understand it, we need to tell your stories, scale your impact, and help others, other parts of the world apply this as well. So how do you, how do, you do that? We like to ground the conversation in small places, in, uh, in shared conversations around uh, what makes places great. We have an exercise we call the place evaluation game. Has people going out and evaluating it based on these criteria? Are there things to do in the space? This, these, these simple questions help people take off their expert hat or their hat as their, what, as their advocate for this one issue and listen to each other. Uh, sort of connect to their own common sense about what they know about place and placemaking. Um, and are there, are there excuses to spend time in this space? So uses and activities. Do I have a reason to stop in front of the store, to feel like I'm not loitering there? Is it, is it comfortable? Does it have an inviting image, the unique to this community, one that I can relate to, that reflects my personality? Um, is it connected, safe to walk along? Can you cross the street? Isn't it sociable? Are there women, children, elderly, people in groups there? So it turns out that these same criteria uh, are the criteria that lead people to be attached to a place. Now, lovability, place attachment are increasingly need, they're increasingly focuses for, for development, for economic development. And, uh, and they move the conversation away from just livability, which is key, we want livability for more, but we've, we're finding that a focus on lovability and place attachment actually can, achieve livability more affordably, more inclusively, uh, and sometimes more quickly. And so this study by the, the Knight Foundation found that uh, it wanted, wanted to figure out what led people to be attached to their community. And it thought it was gonna be livability criteria like schools and healthcare availability and jobs. Um, and there was very little correlation between attachment and those criteria, but a very high correlation between three things that are reflected in that previous diagram. Uh, opportunities for social engagement, sociability, openness uh, to all kinds of people, how welcoming a place is, uh, and then aesthetics. It had to be beautiful too. But the study found that being beautiful alone never led to place attachment. You don't just fall in love with a person or a place just because it's beautiful. You fall in love with it uh, because it, it you feel welcome there, and you like it, you want to engage with people there, you feel connected. 
Um, so this same study found that when people are more attached to a place, there's higher economic growth um, and there's higher entrepreneurship. You're more likely to invest in the long term if you're more attached to a place, to take risks. Uh, and we think to take and to invest in ways that contribute back to place, to start businesses that give love to the street, to each other, to, to build buildings that really respect and reflect the culture of the place. So what is placemaking? Uh, it's really, it's just an ongoing process of how we best work together to shape our shared value, to shape our places. Um, to, you know, and, it's, it, and its place is always locally defined. It's not someone else telling you what your place is. It's how you define the value, uh, that shared value, that purpose and meaning. Um, but we're also finding, there was, a, there was an MIT study that found that the biggest benefit of place isn't the improved place, but the improved social capital and the improved capacity that's created through the placemaking process. So placemaking is about strengthening the connection between people and the places they share. Uh, it's also now a global movement. And I'll talk about how we're actually tomorrow launching a new organization uh, to support placemaking as a global movement. Uh, it's, it's a movement to reimagine and reinvent public spaces that is the heart of every community. It's really turn upside down the shaping of cities. But a framework to make this practical, pragmatic, uh, doable, uh, to, to structure the conversation in a, in a creative, fun way is, is something we call the power of 10. And we're going to do an exercise on Barry Street later this afternoon on this that I invite you to, to join us on. Um, but we think any community, however, whatever size, succeeds most effectively, most quickly, if, it's, if it reinvents itself around its public destinations. And so we think New York, where I'm from, uh, uh, has reinvented itself around its public destinations. And really, it's the story, though. We would never ask any part of the world to copy any of these destinations. But we do think any part of the world should learn a lot from the stories of transformation, just as it's the stories, it's the people behind the places that are most important. And we, we've found that in every case of, of a great public space or a great place making transformation, we know there's someone who we would consider a zealous nut behind that. Someone who's very passionate, a little bit crazy, uh, doesn't, doesn't say, take no for an answer. Um, and, I, and I'm sure there's, and I, I know for a fact that there's a higher quotient of zealous nuts in Vermont than, than anywhere. <laughs> Um, but, but supporting placemaking is about drawing out the zealous nut and everybody supporting that, um, challenging people that are, sometimes zealous nuts start off as being against something and they have to, and for a good reason, all these projects started off because someone was opposed to some, some demolition, uh, a new development, but they became effective when they started to argue for what they want, for, to, to have a vision for what they want and how they, and they became even more effective when they became facilitators of other people coming into that vision. Uh, and then most importantly, those people are now helping to program and manage the spaces. The management of downtowns, of public spaces, is the most important part of it. And but each of those work, each of those destinations work at the place scale, at the human scale, the scale at which you make eye contact with people, um, the, the you connect with each other. Uh, a great destination has at least 10 places, so a great uh, you know, Main Street or, or you know, even a great you know, waterfront or square or farmer's market has at least 10 places, each with 10 things to do in it. Uh, and it's the things you do there that, al that allow it to be welcoming to all, that it's not just for kids or not just for older people, uh, that you can watch your kids uh, playing in a fountain while you have a coffee or a beer. Um, the, the idea of a children's reading room next to a library, uh, in a library next to a bus stop with a coffee cart out front, uh, with something kids can play on. It's the triangulation of these uses that make the magical places in our downtowns. A storefront can do it. Uh, this, this is the slowest place in my neighborhood, but it, my neighborhood is all three-story buildings. Uh, with the same mix of, re of retail in Brooklyn uh, that you have here. And that's the scale at which cities of all scales work. Uh, Littleton, New Hampshire, we did a planning process there a long time ago. We did this Power of 10 exercise. Um, but they realized that the downtown, even though it had the same population, because of small ways that the roads had been designed and the buildings had been suburbanized, the walkable parts of downtown had receded to those two small areas. And they, be, they uh, par everyone expected to need to park right in front of those two small areas. We realized though, 100 years ago, the population wasn't necessarily bigger, but the walkable area felt a lot larger. 
because of, because of the simple ways that small buildings and, the, and uh, the streets had been designed to allow that, that connection. Small places, these power of 10 places along the space. And so the goal is essentially to reclaim these spaces, the parking lots on the waterfront, sim similar to Montpelier here, um, the, to create that walkable area. And that's actually how you solve the parking problem. Uh, you need, first of all, all the best places in the world have huge parking problems. You're not a good downtown unless you have a parking problem. Um, and you, you, downtowns outcompete other parts of the world because there are more suburban areas because they're places you go to for many reasons, for in reasons you don't even know that might happen there. So you want to park right on the edge. The parking, all of a sudden, there's a lot more parking in this area if you park on the edge. And you can have some high turnover parking areas in, in front or for handicapped people and so forth. Um, but we need to look at building the walkable areas of downtown as part of uh, making more parking available, essentially, and getting more street life and making retail viable because more people are walking by your businesses. So placemaking is at the small scale. This is in Bellingham, Washington. They wanted to do a huge streetscape redesign. We said, let's just start with small places. In front of a bakery and a shoe repair store, they created this, this bulb out, took out two parking spots. Uh, but it's li driven by the uses and activities for those spaces. I'm going to go a little faster. Um, but the, the biggest obstacle uh, for downtowns is transportation. It's often parking, but it's planning for cars and traffic. Uh, this is the experience people have crossing many downtowns. This is in Sydney, Australia. Um, and you don't go downtown after that. You want to, go, you want to drive to the, the mall. Uh, after you, that, it's a fear-inducing experience. It, dis it really disconnects your attachment to place. Your, um, and for children, even more importantly, the radius around the home, the children have been allowed to go at nine years old. I have a nine-year-old son. Um, he's just been allowed to start crossing streets on his own in Brooklyn. Um, but if you go back you know, generations, in, in most parts of the world, the radius around the, beyond the home that nine-year-old children have been allowed to go is shrunk in 90% each generation. So again, that's, that's the heart of the environmental crisis. If people don't feel safe and connected to the world beyond their home, we're not going to solve it. We need to, we need to turn that back around. And it's, and it's the way we design our streets uh, to, to be unsafe, to be violent, and uh, very dangerous for children, for everyone. Uh, is, is a big crisis. But the way to turn that around is not to be against cars, it's to be for people and places. And I'm actually very excited about how we can utilize the, the prospect of autonomous vehicles to leverage this future. Whether or not they are a good thing or a bad thing is very debatable, and how soon they, they get come into play is very debatable. But the idea that they actually can thrive around be going to downtowns, not through them, because they don't, don't need to park. And they actually won't do well in a pedestrian-rich environment, because people can walk in front of them. They, we can start to envision a future of downtowns that are f destination streets. Um, this is a, a downtown plan, we, master plan we did for Brunswick, Maine, or actually where I went to college. Um, and uh, we're talking about how do we need a full hierarchy, a typology of streets in our transportation systems to uh, anchor it around destination streets, streets you go to, not through. If you do drive on them, you, you have to basically walk your car through these, through these streets. So we, it, but you need a full hierarchy, and you need this, the, the, the outcomes, the safety outcomes, the comfort outcomes of the streets need to be determined by the people that live near them and, and support them. We need networks. We need some throughput. But increasingly, especially with the potential of autonomous vehicles, People will be able to go wherever they like even more so, and they'll go to the places, that, the best places, the places they love the most, the places that other people love the most. That's where they'll invest. Um, and they'll come here from New York, whether you like it or not. They'll, they're going to come here from New York overnight in their autonomous vehicle to come to the coolest towns in Vermont. Uh, so it's better that you, to, to prevent your communities from changing because of New Yorkers like me, uh, you need to have a really strong vision of defined locally to get people to respect those culture, invest in ways that add to it, and so forth. So just as disciplines, traffic engineers, other disciplines are in silos, so are community institutions. We have, uh, in, at a local level, a state level, nationally, uh, we, we plan all these institutions in isolation. And in a way, often, they're competing to take shared value. Even though they all have place-making goals, they, they suck place value from their communities in many cases. Uh, sometimes the least public buildings in, in downtowns are often public buildings. 
but we need to turn that inside out, and we find that the biggest benefit of placemaking is often just convening these partners around a small intersection in a rural area, a downtown Main Street, connecting the, the librarians with the businesses, with the P city hall, with the churches, transit agencies, theaters, arts people. They all need to come out of their boxes and listen to each other and give each, uh, encourage, coerce each other to compete to shared value, to compete to give love to the, their shared spaces. So place making is turning the inside out. So quick example, and I'll get, start to wrap up, but uh, this is in, in Maine, Congress Square Park, um, a, a very well-intended new squ uh, square in the 80s. Uh, started off to a good start, but it wasn't managed and programmed. Um, about, you know, from 20 years ago uh, till about 15 years ago, it was very uh, unsafe and not a friendly place. It was a net negative for, this, for, this, for downtown Portland, Maine. Uh, just a few benches, a lot, of, a lot of homeless people in the space that were considered threatening. Um, and uh, the city came up with a plan to sell the lot and sell it to a hotel, an out, an out of state hotel owner next door and put an event center on the space. Community was very opposed to this, uh, became, very, um, became a very negative discussion. Um, I got to come there and we talked about how actually the best way to oppose it is to have a vision for what they want uh, and to start doing things, to start doing small, lighter, quicker, cheaper ideas, short-term, low-cost events. So they put some chairs out there, a food truck. It was just resourceful uh, through this space. And there started to be lots of positive activity in the space, um, adding more amenities, creating the power of 10, lots of reasons to be there, all led by the community. The city, the downtown organization, didn't have capacity to manage or maintain this. It became a big political, so successful, it became actually a big political issue where they passed a referendum to prevent the city from being able to sell this, par this park. The mayor actually lost his job because of this issue, because he had supported this. Um, became the heart of a political conversation citywide around public spaces and placemaking. Uh, and it's become the heart of this sort of revitalization effort for the city led in a very grassroots community driven way, it's try, always trying different things. Um, and we've gotten to work with them at several different phases and so forth. Um, but it's, it's the stories, it's the people behind these. There's a video of this that's also wonderful of the people behind it, the elderly people that go out and maintain it every day that, that have their social connections because of it. Uh, but this is one of these many stories that proves that it takes a place to create a community and a community to create a place. So how that place builds community is key to how it reinvents government, governance as well. Uh, the, gov the participation of many different departments statewide. We, yesterday we had an amazing meeting that we could never have in any other state of leaders from many different agencies here and advocates in other parts of the, of the other sectors about how to, create a, how to support your existing statewide placemaking campaign, how to celebrate that, tell the stories, and how to go to, go to new levels. Uh, this is, I've worked a lot in Australia where they're developing metrics called place capital metrics to make sure that all the agencies are, are working towards shared goals and, uh, and collaborating across different disciplines. So to, to accelerate this, to amplify this movement, to tell the stories, I'm really excited to say that tomorrow we're actually launching a new organization. Our website will be up. Uh, and then next week in Europe, uh, we're, we're, we'll have a, a more official launch as well um, for this organization called Placemaking X, which is really to tell the stories of the local placemaking leadership, the statewide efforts, national efforts around the world, uh, the great projects, the great leaders, uh, to help create sort of a backbone organization for a placemaking movement. My, uh, my father, who founded Project for Public Spaces in 1975, um, so just retired from PPS last year. He also, he organized the first Earth Day in New York. And a lot of his friends, a lot of the people I grew up around were the founders of the environmental movement. We see place and placemaking as a way to bring new partners to environmentalism, to reinvigorate it, to, uh, to, to allow everyone to see themselves as a placemaker, as an environmentalist, um, to come from many different causes and you know, I can think of no better place to 
to, sort of, to, to have this conversation really be launched actually then, then here in the strength of what you all have brought, the strength of your communities. Um, so it's really meaningful for me to, to get to be here to, to have this conversation and to learn from you. Um, so my father said that uh, everyone has the right to live in a great place. More importantly, everyone has the right to contribute to making the place where they live or where they already live great. Um, so the right to contribute, the right to participate. We can't just be consumers of solutions of good ideas. We all have to be co-creators of our community, of our planet. Um, it, it, to, to the vision of Placemaking X is to make the spaces we live into places we love, to create thriving, equitable, and to, to create a thriving, equitable, and sustainable world through the convergence of values, passion, and action around public spaces. Um, and we're creating, a, as I said before, Cecilia Martinez said, we're creating a global movement to shape spaces into places. Uh, it's a global network of leaders who together will accelerate placemaking as a way to create healthy, inclusive, and beloved communities. So we have conferences that are going on all over the world. This is a network of some of the leaders. Um, my father, actually, one of his mentors was Margaret Mead who said that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, he also, his mentors were also William White and, and Jane Jacobs. Um, and uh, our, you know, our organization, our first grant was actually by the Rockefeller Family Foundation um, and by someone who, who grew up um, or whose, whose mother I knew who grew up at the uh, Marsh Billings Farm in, in Woodstock and has a deep connection to Vermont as well. Um, these are some of the, the senior advisors. You'll, you'll see the website tomorrow. Um, but the, the approach is to connect eff efforts to advocate for systemic change, as you all are doing, and as this group you have, is, or tomorrow is doing, uh, to, to amplify the stories, the leadership, the, the, the great the campaigns that are, are happening, um, and to accelerate impact, to figure out ways to, to to accelerate the great placemaking grant programs that are, are models you know, that you all are leading from AARP, uh, from many different groups here. To use the power of 10 as a framework for accelerating impact, telling the stories, getting different state. We, we want Vermont to be the first you know, placemaking X state that's tell, that's, uh, that has you know, 10 cities or 10 towns that uh, each have 10 destinations, each with 10 places and so forth, we, you know, whatever metrics you want to define. We want to show how all these different causes are converging around place, all the different movements are converging around place. Next week in, in Europe, uh, we're launching it. There's conferences uh, you know, all over the world that are gathering the placemaking leadership groups. Uh, but you know, we, this is really effectively, I should put this on the map too, because this event is gathering placemaking leaders from around Vermont um, to continue the, the strong tradition that you've, that you've led for generations. Um, and building a strong foundation on which you'll, you'll continue to lead uh, you know, what is a global movement with global um, ex uh, examples. So uh, I hope to see you at these conferences around the world as well. I hope to keep learning from you coming back here, being connected to this. Uh, I'll be around all day. Uh, um, glad to love to connect further with all of you and have conversations. Uh, and we're doing this, this Power of Ten workshop for Berry Street, which will be very fascinating. Um, but I understand there's not time for questions now, but I hope to talk to you individually later. So thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this. And it was a huge pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. That was great. Um, Place-based projects, power of 10, things that I think folks can take and put into practice back in all of our communities that we love and value. Um, I have a few housekeeping items to go over, but first I, uh, I want to, Mr. Brady forgot someone. Paul, you said last night he was the perfect deputy secretary. And don't mess up or something along those lines. Well, he messed up a little. I, I think we uh, forgot a founder, Barb Grimes. The, uh, she was the commissioner of um, Department of Housing and Community Affairs. And so just wanted to recognize her as well. Um, so a few housekeeping items before folks break up into their selected uh, 
workshops. Uh, they're four sessions. They're located around Montpelier. They're primarily at Bethel Bethany Church, Kellogg Hubbard Library, Vermont History Museum, and Lost Nation Theater. They're all in your program guides. There's maps. There's also a tour of the State House uh, back here later in the afternoon. Lunch is on your own. There's a ton of restaurants around town. Um, you know, network, have fun, explore the downtown. There's also a whole bunch of things to do on your own and the insert in the program. There's a tour of the French Block Apartments, which has recently opened. Uh, there's art at the Garage uh, Cultural Center. Uh, there's presentations available, so please uh, take a, a detailed look at your program. And uh, remember, there's the Creativity Thrives downtown reception uh, at 5 to 9 tonight on Langdon Street. The street will be closed, there'll be food trucks, there'll be art, music, um, drinks, activities. It's a great public place to uh, enjoy. Uh, your ticket is in your name badge on the back for your drink, um, so don't forget that. And everyone have fun. If you have any questions, find someone that has a uh, red on the bottom staff that can help with any of your detailed uh, questions about today's agenda. And once again, thank you all for coming. and. Um, have fun and learn a lot. Thanks.